a real pleasure to be here, especially a pleasure to follow Walter Mead, who is one of the, has been for many years one of the sane voices in American foreign policy, and uh, it's great to hear him talk about this subject, which I had not heard before. And indeed, uh, I appreciate Mark inviting me again to speak on the subject of the Christian theological basis for, for, for religious freedom, uh, which I don't get to do very much. I think about it a lot, but I don't get to address it much in public. So I particularly like that part out about not getting drunk on the eschaton, uh, not, and, and being surprised by the eschaton. I'm going to be probably a little less humble in what I have to say to you, but uh, here goes. Let's talk about it. I believe the most profound and powerful reasons for religious freedom are Christian reasons. And they extend not only to Christians, but to all people. In my view, this means that there is also a deep theological warrant for international religious freedom, including its positive impact on international security. Last year, we commemorated the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which as a Catholic, I did not celebrate. <laughs> but it's appropriate to recall the theology of religious freedom as it emerged from reformers such as Luther and Calvin. Today I'm going to emphasize the pre-Reformation roots of religious freedom and how they converged with the ideas of the Protestant Reformation and uh, in the American founding. The roots of religious freedom as emerged in America also lie in the scriptures, the early church fathers and the Middle Ages. So my remarks today are also a reflection on the importance of Christian theology to American foreign policy. I spent 21 years as an American diplomat, and I could tell you it's a pretty secular profession, which is one reason I appreciate Walter Mead. Madeleine Albright once wrote that diplomats of her era were trained to avoid religion. Well, that religion avoidance syndrome has diminished in recent years, but the underlying skepticism about religion has unfortunately not disappeared from foggy bottom. I'm not suggesting that our foreign policy should be Christian. I am suggesting that an aggressive secularism at the State Department has handicapped our 20-year-old policy of advancing international religious freedom. It's clearly encouraged, for example, the hesitancy at State and USAID to channel U.S. assistance to religious minorities such as Iraqi Christians and Yazidis, a hesitancy that is, not to put too fine a point on it, grotesque in light of the United States having officially declared that those two groups are the victims of genocide, and in light of the critical need for religious pluralism in Iraq. One answer to that question is that our foreign policy elites no longer understand the true meaning and reach of religious freedom to America or to anyone else. Their decisions are tactical and, un and in my view, deeply mistaken. In a few cases, they're simply anti-Christian. The remedy is not to assert the superiority of Christianity, but to remind the skeptics of the Christian roots of this precious right of religious freedom. No Christianity, no religious freedom. No Christianity, no secular democracy that protects the rights of all human beings, Christian or not. Unfortunately, notwithstanding Christianity's contributions to the world, in the early 21st century, much of the academy, the media, the entertainment industry, the corporate world, and progressive movements in general view Christianity as irrational, illiberal, and intolerant. I think Walter Mead's comments about thinking through issues. This view helps fuel opposition to religious freedom in the West and helps confound our ability to sell it to skeptics abroad. Of course, there are historical examples of Christian intolerance and coercion. In the fifth century, Augustine used the scriptures to justify coercion of the heretical Donatists. And of course, the Inquisitions were state and church-sponsored efforts to deter heresy and save souls by burning heretics. Contemporary critics of Christianity certainly cite these examples, but in the main, today's opposition to Christian teachings derives from the church's resistance to modern norms of freedom as radical individualism and human autonomy, especially in matters of sex and sexuality, such as abortion, same-sex marriage, and the right to construct one's gender, gender identity. Under these circumstances, it's perhaps not surprising that skeptics tend to ignore the rich 
tapestry of Christian teachings on human freedom, human dignity, including religious freedom. But those teachings are critical to understanding how modern ideas of freedom and self-government emerged in the first place. The origins of the Christian understanding of human freedom, including religious freedom, reside in the scriptures. The book of Genesis declares that each of us is created in the image and likeness of God, as you know, but consider the implications of this idea. First, if each of us bears God's image, we are in a profound sense equal to each other. Second, in imaging God, each of us possesses intellect, the kind of intellect that Russ Walter Mead was calling you to use, and will. This is imaging God, the wellspring of free choice. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection emphasize these ideas of equality and freedom by freeing each of us from the bondage of sin. As Paul put it in Galatians, for freedom, Christ has set us free. This was, of course, not the idea of human autonomy that we have today. The Christian logic of religious liberty is this. True liberty is the freedom to choose God in this life and therefore in the next. But God does not coerce us to choose him. Jesus did not coerce obedience or belief. To do so would have eliminated the way we image God. That is our intellect and will and the source of our dignity and our human choice beyond our Christian souls. Each of us is truly free because we're capable of choosing and free to choose the true and the good. Christianity's first three centuries were experienced as a tiny but growing minority religion, often under severe persecution. This experience produced theological reflection on the end times and the meaning of persecution and suffering such as we see in Peter's letters and in Revelation. But the experience of persecution, combined with reflection on the scriptures then being placed into the canon, also yielded remarkably rich, forward-looking and optimistic reflections on religious freedom in the midst of persecution. The works of early church fathers such as Tertullian and Lactantius posited a revolutionary idea. We're talking third and fourth centuries. The very nature of religion requires free choice. Accordingly, justice requires freedom for all in matters of religion. Their ideas were expressed in the Edict of Milan, issued in 313 by the Emperor Constantine. The edict declared religious freedom for all throughout the Roman Empire and was history's first declaration of universal religious freedom. Unfortunately, that policy did not last. Constantine's successors abandoned universal religious freedom, in part because the early Middle Ages saw struggles over core questions of Christian orthodoxy. I mentioned Augustine and the Donatists, but other questions such as, what is the true nature of Christ? Is he human, divine, both? Who is Mary, the mother of Jesus? Is she also the mother of God? Constantine's successors used coercion to punish heretics and schismatics. True religion, religious freedom would not emerge until the modern era. Nevertheless, the seeds had been planted within the body of church teachings and later flowered. Lactantius, for example, was read and quoted by Thomas Jefferson in the 18th century and by the Catholic Declaration on Religious Freedom in 1965. But those seeds did not lie dormant all those centuries in between. Several developments in Christian theology and philosophy kept them alive, so let me name three. Three developments between the early church fathers and the modern era. First was the assertion by popes of libertas ecclesiae, the freedom of the church over against secular authority. As secular kings and emperors began to emerge in medieval Europe, the church declared a principle that would be crucial to the development of democracy and civil society the principle that the secular state has no warrant over ecclesiastical and spiritual matters and is therefore limited in its power. This tension played out during the Middle Ages with secular rulers and religious clergy battling over the boundaries between church and state. While the two often collaborated, to be sure, such as in the Inquisitions and the Crusades, the claim of Libertas Ecclesiae was a seminal step toward the concept of a limited state 
and helped establish the framework for what, for what became modern social pluralism. It is no accident that one of history's formative documents of limited government, England's Magna Carta in 1215, begins with a declaration of the freedom of the church. A second medieval development that would contribute to the modern understanding of religious freedom was the emergence of the idea of individual conscience. You may think this was invented in the Reformation. By the 11th and 12th centuries, canonists, you can call them Protestant canonists if you like, were drawing on the epistles of Paul to declare that all men have a duty to follow the dictates of their consciences, even if doing so puts them in conflict with church authority. Again, this teaching, which still exists in the Catholic Church, is not the modern idea of a free-floating free autonomous conscience. The greatest duty of men and women is to ensure their consciences are well formed in the truths of the church. But then, as now, the church teaches that an erring conscience can send you to hell. But it also teaches that if you are certain your conscience is correct, you must follow it. This idea did not lead to full religious freedom, but was crucial to its development, I would argue. A third medieval contribution to religious freedom was the beginnings of the idea that all persons possess natural rights as the result of natural law. That is to say, rights that adhere to them by virtue of their existence rather than as the grant of kings or the positive law. 1963, letter from a Birmingham jail. If you haven't read it, read it. By the 12th and 13th centuries, church authorities were writing of a natural right to property and self-defense. The 16th century Dominican Bartolomea de las Casas defended the natural rights of American Indians against Spanish and Portuguese oppression by appealing to these medieval sources on natural rights. Now, of course, the Protestant Reformation made a st substantial contribution to what later became the American understanding of religious freedom. Some of that contribution stemmed from the former's rejection of the authority of the Catholic Church Martin Luther and John Calvin in particular emphasized, as you know, the supremacy of individual conscience in matters of religion and the authority of the Bible rather than the church. But, as we've seen, most of these arguments did not appear in the 16th century. Many of them were present among church thinkers for 1,500 years. But it was not until the American Revolution and the American constitutional settlement that religious freedom emerged full-blown in its modern sense. Let's turn briefly to that understanding of religious freedom present at our founding. Few of the American founders were Catholics. Concession on my part happens to be true. Most of the founders had some debt to reform theology and some quite significant debts. But the American constitutional settlement was grounded on a belief in the value of religion for individuals and for society and the consequent necessity to protect the free exercise of religion in law. There are echoes here of both the Reformation and of ancient and medieval Christian ideas. So let me give you three quick examples in the American founding. First, the founding generation venerated the role of religious conscience in human nature and social flourishing. James Madison, we know about. Um, as he put it, religion is precedent both in order, and in order of time and degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. He was talking about the claims of the religious conscience. Second, the core American democratic principle of limited government was in part derived from a core Christian concept, the sinfulness of man. Did you ever hear of that? Speaking of the eschaton, which is the root cause of the corruption that inevitably accompanies concentrations of power. The founders believe that no group should be invested with too much power for too long. Boy, we, we've moved away from that understanding. The idea of limited government was also supported by the commitment of religious citizens to an authority greater than the state and by the role of religious communities in the voluntary, voluntary institutions of civil society. What would we do without 
the faith-based aspects of American civil society. Third, most Americans believe that the new republic would fail without a virtual, virtuous citizenry and that the greatest source of virtue was religion. They came to accept that religion's contribution to the common good in law and public policy was not through establishments and religious monopolies, but through the free and peaceful contention of citizens' moral and religious arguments in our public life. These and other colonial views led to the First Amendment's guarantee of the free exercise of religion for all individuals and religious communities. Note that last point. When the Protestant founders considered wording for what became the First Amendment, one option was protecting the rights of conscience. They, choose in, they chose instead to protect the free exercise of religion. First Amendment Michael McConnell, a scholar Michael McConnell argues they chose that phrase, the, first, the free exercise of religion, because they wanted to protect the public rights involved in free exercise. Conscience is an interior matter not just those private rights of conscience. Equally important, they were protecting, said McConnell, the rights of religious communities, not just individuals in the free exercise of religion. Many believe that the First Amendment's ban on establishment was to keep religion out of our public life. You hear that a lot. If you haven't heard it, you're not listening. The purpose of the Establishment Clause is to keep religion out of our public life. Precisely the opposite is what they intended, our founders. That is to say, the ban on establishment is to protect religion from government, thereby to limit the power and reach of government and ensure the moral vibrancy of the American people. Note that while these ideas had deep roots in Catholic and Protestant Christian thought, they protected everyone, not just Christians. Let me end with some thoughts on how all of this relates to U.S. foreign policy. In my view, the essence of the American understanding of religious freedom is what we should be advancing in our foreign policy. That is equal protection in law and culture for the free exercise of religion. Now, as many of you know, we've had since 1998 a uh, statutory requirement to advance religious freedom. That was the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. November 9th, by the way, the Religious Freedom Institute of where I work is having a public event. Uh, go to the religiousfreedominstitute.org. If you want to come to that event, we have all five of the uh, former and present ambassadors at large for religious freedom, including Sam Brownback. Uh, go to religiousfreedominstitute.org and it'll tell you where. It's this next Friday. Unfortunately, in my view, as I said at the outset, uh, we have lost in our foreign policy establishment, Walter Mead notwithstanding, the understanding of religious freedom as it was understood by our founders. And I think this is uh, important in explaining why we have had such a, a small impact in the last 20 years in our foreign policy. I mean, the greatest nation of the world, the largest diplomatic establishment, etc., cetera, et cetera. It's gotten worse rather than better. This is not our fault, but we could have done better. I think things are getting better under the current ambassador at large, Sam Brownback, and the ministerial this summer, I think, helped approve of us. Those of us who are, who are Christians have good reasons for supporting this foreign policy. We're American citizens who want to further our nation's interests. So let me end by five ways that you, those of you who are Christians, can act to advance our religious freedom policy for Christians and others. First, we have a Christian responsibility, I would argue, to stand for those who are being persecuted for their religious beliefs. We have to do it with love rather than hatred, to be sure. But love of Christ surely means defending those who are suffering in his name. Second, as Christians, we must pray. At Gethsemane, Christ asked Peter, James, and John to pray. They failed him. Let's don't fail him now. Third, we should act as citizens who have the right, and I would argue the responsibility, to influence our own government. I su suggest we support our ambassador at large, Sam Brownback. Fourth, 
we Americans have a particular responsibility to retrieve that traditional understanding of religious freedom. For that reason alone, it encompasses religious freedom for everyone. We're in danger of losing that today. Fifth and finally, we must do more to defend religious freedom by exercising it as Christians. Those of us who are Christians must live openly as Christians without apology in our increasingly secularist and hostile societies. We're threatened by secularist hostility, but I would argue the greater threat is our own indifference. Particularly in defending our Lord's teachings on the sanctity of life and on marriage and on sexual morality. It's tough. If you're a Christian, don't hide your light under a basket. Why should we merit the name Christian if we decide to do that? Let me stop there and take any comments and questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for the discussion here. I wanted to see if you could go back to what you initially talked about, uh, maybe relaying the patristic foundation for religious freedom and, or freedom of conscience. I think it's important to emphasize this, including to a Christian audience, but even more to secular audiences who have the narrative of history reflected, for example, in the book The Stillborn God by Mark Lilla or the New York Times piece that uh, came before that. I highly recommend it if you want to delve into why I emphasize this. He argued that there was the great separation during the 17th century, which finally got religion out of the hair of public life. Prior to that, the Middle Ages was, uh, was basically theocratic and angry and oppressive. Uh, he attributes most of this to the Catholic Church, but the, the Protestants don't get off you know, this goes through the Reformation, and he cites stuff we know about. What he doesn't cite is what I talk about today. The theological musings of people living in a time of persecution as Christians. They're not a majority. They're a tiny minority. They're beginning to grow. All they have is their belief in Jesus Christ. They're beginning to build the canon, Tertullian, Lactantius. Go back and read them. Thomas Jefferson did. His quotes from Lactantius are in the margins of his bill to establish religious freedom in, in Virginia. Um, and by the way, I intended to bring them, but I forgot. We, uh, the Religious Institute, Religious Freedom Institute, and our work at Georgetown have produced two volumes from a two-year uh, project called Christianity and Freedom. And the two volumes have that title, Christianity and Freedom. And they go, there's a, there's a chapter by the great University of Virginia uh, emeritus professor Robert Louis Wilkin, one of the great uh, patristic writers of our time in English, I think, and he makes these points. He's been to see Jefferson's book in the National Archives. So there's not a straight line between Lactantius and Jefferson, but it is simply a mistake to think that religious freedom came out of the Enlightenment, the, the, the pagan and uh, the, the, think, the pagan thinking that elevated reason to the top. This is the standard narrative today. And this is why, if you believe that, it is quite easy to say, well, the Establishment Clause is designed to keep religion out of our public life. It's superstition, it's violent, it's angry, uh, it admits of no compromise, that's uh, Rawls. If you're familiar with the great American uh, political, arguably the greatest in the second half of the 20th century, uh, John Rawls, get religion and all other comprehensive systems out of our public life because you can't compromise. So, long answer to your good question. Go back to Walter Mead. Learn your history. It didn't begin with the Protestant Reformation. It's okay to be a little triumphalist about that if you like. But find out what happened in the second and third. I mean, and you Protestants read the Bible very well. And I hope you, you know, so do Catholics occasionally. 
Um, read, the, read the New Testament stuff that, uh, that yields what Tertullian and Lactantius and the Old Testament stuff were writing about in the second, third, and fourth centuries. Find out about the Edict of Milan. Find out about these canonists in the 11th and 12th centuries. If you want recommendations, I'll give them to you. That talk about conscience. You must follow a well-formed conscience, but be careful. Now, most people don't realize that's part of the Catholic canon. All right. Hope that helps. Hi, Brad Littlejohn, Leesburg, Virginia. Thanks for your talk. Um, my question, sort of moving forward in history, um, your use of the concept of libertas ecclesiae in the Middle Ages. Um, now, I mean, my understanding is that's not, that's not an effort to um, say that there should be no uh, coercive jurisdiction over conscience. Rather, it's trying to get the state out of the coercive jurisdiction over conscience so that the church's own coercive jurisdiction over conscience is left intact. And Official Catholic teaching up until at least 1965 would defend the idea that the church does have a course of jurisdiction over conscience. So I guess I'm curious to hear you say more about whether the Catholic understanding is really um, historically compatible with the kind of Jeffersonian American understanding of freedom of conscience. Sure. Great question, and thank you for asking it. In the, in the fifth and sixth centuries, there was no capacity uh, as there might be in the modern period for the Catholic Church ecclesiastically to coerce conscience. If by that you mean, uh, well, it depends on what you mean by coercion, I suppose. The Catholic Church has always taught, let me be clear, and still teaches today that it is the Church left by Jesus Christ in the fullness of truth. And you're all invited, by the way, to join. <laughs> the question of coercion of conscience is 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 difficult to tease out against that premise because that premise is true and I think it under, underlines what you're getting at. How do you coerce consciences? Do you say, I mean, how do you avoid it? Do you avoid coercing conscience by saying it doesn't matter? Well, let's, let's don't go there. I mean, a lot of people have. And by the way, in the Second Vatican Council, Dignitatis Humanae, I refer to it, the Catholic Declaration on religious freedom. It says in a footnote by the American John Courtney Murray, who was there at the council, nowhere in this document is, count, is conscience used as it is in the modern era often, meaning I get to do what I want to do because my conscience tells me I can do it. That's that free-floating understanding. So the church coerces, if you like, by saying you must form your conscience well or you're going to go to hell. Is that coercion? I don't think so. What it, what it said in 1965 that was, at minimum, a development of Catholic doctrine is that the church no longer claims a privileged access to secular authority. Indeed, it demands that every religious group, and not only other Christians, but non-Christians, have the right in the public sphere to an immunity from coercion all the church demands is libertas ecclesiae, the right to make its claims. So it's a complicated subject. I would argue that the church never moved away. I mean, look, you've got human beings running the church. I don't know if you've noticed that about the Catholic Church uh, in recent uh, weeks. This has always been the case. There has never been an argument, I hope you hear this, that popes are infallible, does not exist. The pope may teach infallibly under certain circumstances, but the pope says two plus two is five. My only obligation as a Catholic is to say, with respect, Holy Father, would you, would you check your numbers or check into a, you know, a clinic? There's no infallible pope. So, what Thomas Aquinas said, I'm, I'm going to answer your question with this, and it's, I hope you don't consider it a dodge. If you do, come see me. I don't think it's a dodge. I, I will repeat what I said before. If your conscience is formed in the truth, you must follow it, even in the face of priests, bishops, popes, 
all the encyclicals in the world. But take care that your conscience is properly formed. To me, that's hard, as frankly everything else about being a Catholic is. I'm a convert, early 90s. It's a pain in the neck to be a Catholic. But I cling to it like a rock in a flood. And I believe that this Thomistic version that I've just given you of conscience makes sense to me, which is why I'm constantly trying to understand what our Lord is teaching in the truth. Stakes are high. So that is not a movement away from conscience. It is an intensification of conscience and probably does explain why the church has appeared to want to coerce, and has, and has. No argument there. I mean, the whole history of, um, you know, the, the, the Inquisition, uh, to a certain extent the Crusades, although that, frankly, Judaism is the victim there more than anyone else. The church did coerce, did attempt to coerce. But the teachings of the church are the ones that have survived, and they were there in the beginning. And I think that's very important, certainly important to me as a Catholic. I hope, that's, I hope that at least answers part of your question. Yeah, real quick. Uh, Jamie Johnson, formerly of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, talk to us about Saudi Arabia as one of the more um, helpful Arab nations toward U.S. foreign policy specifically as it regards the idea of religious freedom. We saw in the Gulf War, many of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, were not allowed to uh, hold copies of the scriptures. Uh, we had to be very guarded in certain things that we were allowed to do while we were there. Can you talk to us about uh, religious freedom in the Arab world, where you see that going, and if any person here wants to work in the Department of State specifically, what might a, a wise uh, route be regarding advancing religious freedom, specifically in Saudi Arabia and also ultimately other Arab nations that want to work with the United States? Well, thanks for that big question. What have I got, 10 seconds to solve that? <laughs> of course, there, I hope there was a little sarcasm at the beginning of your remark. Saudi Arabia has done absolutely nothing to help us with religious freedom unless you might want to make the argument that intelligence support has helped, and I, I, I think that probably can be made. But Saudi Arabia is the poster child of the opposition to religious freedom. How do you fix that? I don't think you're going to fix it with any president or any, any ambassador or any American mission. Ultimately, I will broaden this to the Arab world, which was the end of your, your comment, and I'll try to just round it up with this. My argument about American foreign policy, whether it's here, frankly, or anywhere else, China, Russia, take your pick, is that it's highly rhetorical and reactive. We issue reports, we issue countries of particular concern lists every year. These things are okay. I would not do away with them. I would keep them and, in fact, uh, intensify them, but they're not enough. They're not, not enough arrows in the quiver to get countries to change their policies on religious minorities. That's what we're talking about here. And you're not going to do that with coercion. You want to try invasion, it's probably a bad idea. We have evidence that it's a bad idea. It doesn't work. So military force doesn't work to change the religion of people. You can kill them, but that's, that's not a good idea. So what, what would I say? Self-interest arguments. I spent the last 10 years of my life developing arguments based on utilitarian arguments. They're not the Christian spiritual arguments that we talked about today. Why do you need religious freedom if you're an atheist, a Chinese atheist, or a Saudi uh, imam or an Iranian grand ayatollah when we believe that's nothing more than a Trojan horse by the West? We'll let somebody out of jail every now and then, but we're just not going to do that. Well, here's the answer. It can help you grow your economy. Do you want that? Well, okay. It can help you develop stability. Now, this is a tough argument with the Saudis. I'm side scarping side. But if you want democracy, who wants that in the, in the Arab world? Pakistan? They want stable democracy. They've got a mess now. Pakistan, Egypt, and the others. We could be making self-interest arguments to them. 
not even using the word religious freedom, use the phrase back off of these groups and they will help you with economic growth, they will help you, they're your own citizens. Think about citizenship, that's a good way to approach the, the Islamic world. So that's a very unsatisfactory an answer to a very big question. I invite all of you, if you have any interest in American foreign policy or in the other issues I've discussed, to those of you who are looking for internships, go to religiousfreedominstitute.org. Those of you who are interested in the arguments that we make, we have action teams in the Middle East, in South and Southeast Asia. We have a religious freedom policy action team and also a North America action team. So we're spread around the world making this argument. You want a religious moral argument, we can give you that. But if you want those utilitarian arguments that may undermine your resistance to this as nothing but a, a Trojan horse from the West, um, take a look at what equality under the law for all your citizens can give you. And we're doing that with some measured success. I'm happy to talk to you much more about this if you would like. Thanks. Thanks for having me.